Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few more people joining us. I'm Tracy Mads and I'm the current AWAM president and a faculty member at Brown University. Um, we're so happy to have you all here today, especially given the current state of our nation and of course the uncertainty we're dealing with in the election this morning. Hopefully this will be a good distraction for you all today. It is well known that the, like the rest of the medical field, academic emergency medicine lacks the, di the diversity that it needs to represent and effectively care for the patient population that we serve. We are also well aware of the racism and systemic inequities that so many individuals in our country are currently facing today. In response to both the need for a more diverse workforce, as well as to the ongoing racial injustice in the United States, Many institutions in the House of Medicine have responded to these challenges by either creating or expanding diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. This, of course, includes the creation of new roles and positions related to DEI, um, some of these at the department level, some at the institution level. But many questions remain about how to address the challenges of racism and gender bias in medicine. And that brings us to the webinar today. So we have four experts. I'm really excited that they're all here this morning um, to discuss with us the ins and outs of DEI positions, including the associated pitfalls and challenges that often go along with these roles. We hope to not only have a robust discussion, but to come away with some ideas, to generate some ideas for potential best practices around the creation of DEI roles, hopefully that, that you and I can both take back to our institutions. I'd like to start by introducing my co-moderator, Dr. Jeffrey Dreck, the current ADIEM president. Um, Jeff, would you like to say a few words and introduce your panelists? Tracy, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head, and um, I, I don't think that the fact that this is happening after Election Day is, is lost on anyone. I know this is a difficult day for a large number of people, and um, I guess I just want to uh, voice my own personal um, difficulty with today and, and say that it's a, a normal thing and it's a normal um, experience and with still a lot of indecision going on, uh, please understand that there are a lot of people that feel identical to how you feel. Um, with that being said, it, it is my pleasure to, to start off introducing um, two of our panelists. First off is uh, Dr. Alden Landry, uh, who's an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He's also the assistant dean for the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, the associate director and advisor for the William P. I'm sorry, William B. Castle Society, and the director of health equity education at Harvard Medical School. In addition to being the founder and co-director of a nonprofit organization, Motivating Pathways. Um, I, I'm trying to keep these relatively short so I don't get to talk about all the other spectacular things about, about Dr. Landry um, or the spectacular things about Dr. Brabby. Uh, Cassandra Brabby is an EM physician and assistant professor at the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. She's the residency program director there and vice chair for diversity and inclusion for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Biden Medical Center. Great. Um, I'll go ahead and go ahead and introduce our AWAM panelists today. We have Dr. Michelle Lal and Dr. Esther Chu. Dr. Lal is a board certified emergency medicine physician and associate professor at Emory University, not to mention past AWAM president and, the, and an SAM board member currently. She is the inaugural director of well-being, equity, and inclusion for the Emory University School of Medicine. I think I got that right. She is also an associate residency director and medical education fellowship director for the Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Lull's primary interests are physician well-being and the negative impact of gender bias on equity and inclusion in medicine. She is interested in gender differences and burnout among physicians as well. She has previously presented didactics on physician well-being as well as gender bias in medicine at multiple regional and national meetings. She is part of a national emergency medicine work group focused on exploring and addressing gender and racial biases and disparities in academic emergency medicine. And last but not least, Dr. Esther Chu. She's a professor in the Center for Policy and Research in Emergency Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. She is an NIH funded investigator with expertise in drug policy, injury and gender disparities in healthcare. She is a co-founder of Equity Quotient, a company that provides metrics of healthcare culture and a founding member for Time's Up Healthcare. She is a regular column in The Lancet focused on health disparities. 
which I'm sure many of you have read. And on a more personal note, she has been a mentor and sponsor for countless trainees and has inspired so many of us to join the fight against gender and racial inequities in medicine. So thank you all for being here today. Um, in terms of format, each of our panelists will speak for about five minutes on separate um, but fairly distinct topics, followed by 20 minutes or so for questions at the end. You can put your questions in the chat throughout the hour and we'll make sure to get to as many as possible. And during the discussion phase at the end, please feel free to unmute and ask your questions directly. We really do want this to be an interactive session um, with the goal of generating ideas to help make, um, to really help make DEI positions more effective as we work to fight racism and inequity in our institutions. So with no further delay, we're gonna start with Dr. Michelle Lal, who will be speaking about her experiences with creating DEI roles, including, ma including managing the expectations that go along with these positions. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lal. Thank you, Dr. Madsen. Um, I do think, as Dr. Drex said earlier, this is a really timely presentation, and I hope we're able to give all of you listening a few pearls um, and things that you can take back to your own institutions for implementation. So I think first and foremost is identifying what the need is. Um, so I'm pretty fortunate to work in, an in a department that's really had a culture of inclusivity since before people were talking about it. But there still was a need, a need to grow and a need to move forward. So as you think about your own department or other departments that you, that you have seen, what is the actual need? And you want to try and be very specific when you're trying to cultivate out what the needs of the group are. What are some tangible interventions and outcomes that you can measure? And maybe even taking a step back, do you have any data points? As an example, we realized that at Emory, when HR puts you into the system, you are automatically defaulted to white. So we knew we had a very broad representation of different racial and ethnic groups in our department, but when the School of Medicine would pull our data for us, we couldn't see it. So sure enough, a few of us start going into our PeopleSoft, our HR software, and we're like, well, that's interesting because that's not my race or that's not my ethnicity. So sometimes you even have to take a further step back to know what are you starting with? So questions to think about, does your department or the medical school collect this data? And do they track any other data? So do they track data by salary, promotions, and other opportunities? And these are certainly areas for growth in many of our departments. The other thing you wanna think about when you're trying to create this initial position is what is this job description and expectation gonna look like? So first and foremost, you need to be realistic. So change is very, very challenging in institutions and it takes time. So you need to be very realistic about what one year, three year and five plus year goals would look like. Who's gonna support you? I think that's a huge question. I would assume that if the chair of your department has the interest and is willing to put the resources to creating one of these positions that you are supported, but where is the rest of the support? Is it their support in the medical school for you? What kind of support are you gonna have? Will you have dedicated admin support? A lot of the work that I've been doing in this kind of inaugural year in this position is not really doctor work, it's administrative work. It's creating org charts and other things and highlighting the individuals who are women, who are people of color, and seeing where everybody kind of lays out. What does our leadership look like on every level, at the lower levels, the mid-tier mid levels, and at the highest levels? So some of these things I didn't realize would be necessarily part of my job and that's okay, we work as a team and certainly times have been tough for everybody in their departments with COVID, but you wanna know what your support structure looks like. So again, do you have administrative support? What's your budgetary support? Do you have protected time? And what exactly are the roles and responsibilities that you're being looked at to fill? Are you going to be responsible for education? GME, UME, your APPs, your faculty, faculty development? Are you gonna be responsible for research? Do you have direct reports? What committees are you gonna oversee? And do you have a role that is now expected within the School of Medicine, whether it's to sit on certain School of Medicine committees or be participating in other work groups? So depending on the level of support that you're gonna have, you wanna be really realistic with what you can get done and probably identify just a few, maybe two or three tangibles that you can work towards every year. 
So in my experience, the biggest barriers, and I think as educators, we know this, barrier number one is time. Protecting our time is expensive. And this is not a one, a one woman or one man operation. To really have an effective DEI structure, you need, you need a team. So th it's, it's important to understand what that buy down of time would look like. Other barriers include resources. Certainly um, at our medical school, we often have people in different departments or divisions that are working on similar work, but there's not a lot of collaboration because there's not yet a good established network for us to talk to each other and work with each other. So at times it feels like we are reinventing the wheel when there is probably somebody local or national that could have helped us, but we just didn't know. And then I think the other thing is, is, is there true buy-in? And not to sound like a pessimist, but I think this is something that many groups, organizations, universities, institutions are absolutely saying is a priority right now. But I have seen a lot of talk and not always a lot of action. So you really wanna understand the depth of the buy-in from the people who are gonna support you and what that's gonna look like. And recognize that there's probably gonna be some barriers around your ideas because there may not be the time or the resources to do them at the moment. So I think if I could give you two best practices in consideration of establishing one of these positions, number one, do your homework, see who else out there has done something similar or has a similar position. And once you get an, some, an idea, some examples, then really create clear and concise objectives for what you're hoping to achieve. And then secondly, recruit your team. This isn't a one person job. So what is your team gonna look like? Where are your national and regional collaborators? Where are your school of medicine collaborators? You know, where are they? And where are the collaborators in your department? And maybe they don't know that they should exist yet. You know, so maybe you need an APP who's in charge of DEI. You need a resident lead. You need a staff lead. You need a physician lead, you know? So really look at your entire team and build your group because you won't be successful if you're doing this on an island by yourself. Thank you so much. Those are, those are great thoughts, great ideas. Um, as I mentioned, please um, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll get to them um, at the end. Um, but we're gonna keep moving to our next panelist. Um, next, we have Dr. Landry, Landry, who will be discussing the intersection of DEI roles with medical education in particular including the recruitment of residents and trainees. Wonderful. Um, thank you to all involved for having me here. And thank you um, to ADIM and uh, AWIM for just being a part of this discussion and continuing to lead SAEM in this space. I think it's really important to acknowledge, um, as Michelle was saying, how there's a lot of um, new operations that are happening, people coming into these roles and spaces. Uh, because we recognize the need, um, whether there's true recognition or it is uh, something that is uh, more of a lip service is yet to be determined. And I think that we um, as an SAM, as uh, our uh, academies need to continue to push the envelope and challenge our departments and challenge our chairs, uh, challenge uh, institutional leadership to make sure that this isn't just lip service. And we're actually paying attention to these matters and really um, investing in um, these spaces, not only with putting people in positions with titles, but putting people in positions with resources and support um, and giving them uh, the opportunity to grow professionally while we are asking them to take on oftentimes tasks that are um, very difficult uh, to accomplish uh, and many times unrecognized or um, uh, unsupported uh, in the form of uh, promotion, um, uh, salary and all of those other things. So I guess that's maybe my backdrop. Uh, Michelle, I think you kicked it off really well with um, everything you were saying about time and resources. And um, when I talk about health equity education in this space and I talk about residency recruitment, I think it really falls in line with what you were saying. Um, so with, with the recruitment side of things, as you think about how to diversify your trainee pool, one of the things you have to look at is who is already there in your department from a faculty and trainee perspective. And I can tell you, speaking from a firsthand perspective, um, I was the first black person to come to my residency. And uh, it was um, a very lonely experience uh, being the only. So being the first only and lonely is um, troublesome and can be traumatic. 
Um, I was fortunate in that my department was really supportive of me and my interests because they knew coming into it what they were getting with me was someone who was passionate around these issues related to health equity. Um, but uh, that being said, it was a very lonely experience and it took our department years to bring in more faculty, to bring in more trainees from diverse backgrounds. And so I think that you have to look at where you are and think about how you are going to go about bringing in individuals who are going to be um, faculty in your department and whether that is you hire from within um, bringing your trainees up into the faculty ranks or you do really good in recruiting and bringing people from outside so that's something that you all have to think about um, because trainees don't want to be alone uh, when you are doing your recruitment efforts you have to be honest with these individuals these students are in medical school. They are incredibly intelligent and they can see through the BS that may be happening when a program puts on a really fancy website or hosts an event that is there to promote diversity. Um, we recognize what happens when it comes to tokenism and the things that we may see an institution doing that is not actually moving the needle forward, but really just putting on, um, what's the saying, lipstick on a pig. Uh, so be honest when you're recruiting students and don't overpromise. The last thing you should do is go into a position where you are recruiting an individual from a diverse background, promising them the support that they're going to need. And when they get there, you don't do the support because that individual will go back to their institution, will go back to uh, the students or that, that you send to them to try and recruit for that next wave. And they're not going to be um, blinded by um, uh, all the uh, wonderful things that you were saying to them. And they're going to be really honest. One of the things that I see a lot of places doing right now is really focusing on our Hispanic uh, serving institutions and our HBCUs for recruitment. Um, here to tell people that black and brown students come from many medical schools. Uh, and if that is the only place you're focusing on, then you're gonna miss out on a large swath of applicants. I think it's important that we recognize the value that HBCUs and HSI uh, serve in the, uh, the development of future physicians from diverse backgrounds but there are more places that you can do active recruitment. And I would say when you do this active recruitment, look for places like the SNMA, the Latino Medical Student Association. Those are great opportunities for you to find students who may not be on your radar, who you can bring into your institution, um, who will become great trainees. Um, I am a product of pipeline programs and I encourage everyone to look into how you can advance and expand your pipeline programs that you may be doing. Um, I participated in a program at my institution called the Visiting Clerkship Program. It's now on its 30th year, which shows that um, Harvard and its uh, affiliate hospitals have been committed to pipeline programming from that transition from training to uh, from medical students to training for a very long time. And that still hasn't been the only thing that we've done to work on including, uh, increasing diversity. So as you think about this space, think about what you can do in the form of pipeline programs. And as we are dealing with COVID-19 and the elimination of away rotations, what these virtual rotations may be doing, they may not be, uh, we'll see what the data bears out, but we will see. And then lastly, when you get those students and you get them in uh, those applications and they come to you, be sure to make sure that you are doing a holistic review of those applicants. Um, making sure that you are not showing bias about the institutions that they're coming from or putting up artificial barriers in the forms of step one scores, which will be phased out, but step two scores will exist, and other things that may come in the way of preventing students from going in uh, to or matching into your special into our specialty. Um, so I'll pause there because I want to try and really touch on quickly um, the impact or what we can be doing in health equity education, which are two separate buckets uh, from a from a health equity education standpoint. I think everybody has to be all in on this. Um, every person who presents a lecture should talk about social determinants of health or social drivers of health. They should be talking about health disparities and they should be talking about interventions that can fix the problems that we're alluding to in our lectures. If the only thing we talk about is being black is a risk factor or if you are homeless, you are at higher risk for X, then we're not doing our trainees any uh, service. We need to talk about the root cause. We need to talk about the historical perspective. And we need to talk about the interventions that can be done to eliminate those disparities. We in medicine have gotten really, really good at describing disease patterns, looking at the problems, fixing things that we consider lesions, but we really have to invest in this aspect of medical education because this is how health disparities persist. We have to have these discussions. Not everybody is expected to be an expert in this space, 
But if you shy away from it, then you know the students aren't getting this content. You know the trainees aren't getting this content as a part of their education. And, it, <clears throat> and it's okay to ask for help. I would encourage departments not to do standalone health equity lectures. I think what, oftentimes we see an institution and they'll have their health equity week, and then you don't talk about these issues until the following year for the next health equity week. Guess what? Health disparities persisted that entire time. And so for 51 weeks, we talked about, we didn't talk about it, but week 52, we're right back at it. So think about what you are going to do when you are thinking about how to integrate this into your content. Providing cultural context is really important. Uh, discussing systemic racism is important. Uh, bringing in demographics into the discussion is important. When we think about when we present these research articles and we go to journal club, are we actually talking about table one who's in those groups and saying, you know what, this study actually didn't have a large black or Latinx or Asian population and it was really a white male dominated study. And so therefore we have to think about this with a grain of salt as we try and uh, generalize this to our entire population. Diversify your examples. This happens oftentimes in pictures. There's a great study that talks about the use of um, pictures for dermatology. Um, lectures and, and um, presentations where 80% are on skin that would be considered white or um, lighter skin. Um, and the only time or the time we see darker skin is when we look at um, sexually transmitted infections and genitalia when those tend to be shown on darker skin. And so think about the bias that we may be bringing into that. Um, and then lastly, just be cautious about how we label our patients, especially in these case-based presentations. When you say the 65 year old male versus the 65 year old black male that puts in context into and allows opportunities for bias and racism to exist in medicine. And so I would argue that if you're going to do that, bring in that into the social history and then talk about why race and racism is a part of our social construct. And so maybe I'll stop there and get off of my soapbox. That was wonderful. And I think um, a lot to unpack and a lot to discuss. And I think we're going to have a ton of questions about Dr. Alal and Dr. Landry's portions. Um, the chat is already very active. So keep going with the chat. Um, and then we'll keep going with our presentations and, and we'll um, break for discussion after two more presentations. Um, so next we have Dr. Cassandra Bradby, who will be discussing the importance of really understanding the institutional structure and the metrics around DEI roles. Um, as these are designed and created. I'll hand it over to you. Hi everybody, I'm super excited to be here today uh, and on the same panel as such amazing people. Um, so I'm talking about uh, knowing the structure of your institution and your department when you are creating DE&I roles and how uh, that really impacts like how successful you're going to be uh, in achieving like your goals. And so I have learned a lot by uh, mistake, which is, you know, fail first attempt in learning. So I have done that multiple times uh, in the past six years. So I'm on my third DEA and I roll um, at my institution. Uh, so for my department, I quickly figured out that as a vice chair for diversity inclusion for the department, it is a very different reporting structure than it is for the medical school, which makes sense. Um, but as a vice chair, I present directly to the chair of the department with my thoughts and ideas and what it is we need to do as a department. And to be honest, that is actually the easier of the roles because there's only one person you have to report to um, and make decisions with in terms of what we are going to move forward with as a department. You need to sit down together and make the metrics that you feel are important for your department. Those need to be reasonable and actionable and measurable. And so just saying that we're going to recruit more faculty of diverse backgrounds that sounds well and good but that doesn't mean anything and to be honest like you can't actually just count them like count people in number and think that that's going to get you somewhere um the other thing is like recruiting faculty is not a simple thing you have x number of lines for x number of people and once they're full now well, now what are you going to do um so talking about how the education, how you want to roll out education as a department, who are you educating? Because educating residents and medical students is different than educating your faculty. And so when does that occur? Like if you're gonna do education only during conference time with the residents, well, faculty can't always make that time because someone has to be covering the department, right? So 
making sure that it's integrated into faculty meeting or other time uh, that the faculty uh, are, are available. In addition to that, like we lead by example, right? Like our trainees have to learn from us and they model the behavior that we show. And so if we're talking about social determinants of health and we're talking about other barriers uh, to patient care in the clinical space, it puts it into much better perspective for them than a lecture alone. And so encouraging the same things that Dr. Landry was just talking about. So when we talk about metrics for the department, we talk about education in terms of the residency, education in terms of the medical students, education in terms of faculty. If you want to talk about recruitment, who's on our recruitment committee, who's on PNT? Like, are we making sure that we have diverse voices in all the spaces that we need in our department? Are people included in the decision making process with whatever decisions that is who are who are our leaders in the department who is being promoted to other vice chair positions other leadership positions um, even down to what does our website look like like does our website actually show what it is that we do as a department or are we just showcasing what we want people to see now i also understand that that's part of the job of the website but uh, making sure that we are putting out there the things that we, we are doing um, and making sure that we follow through on that. Like having a diversity statement that you don't do anything with doesn't do anything for your department. And so um, sitting down together to make those uh, decisions and metrics is important. And then the next question becomes, who is responsible for those metrics? And so are you as the DEI uh, leader is like, responsible for those metrics? Does each metric have a different person that's responsible for those? Because when you talk about education, you think about is the residency director in charge of that? Is the vice chair for education in charge of that? So making sure that you have the right people held accountable for those things and it's not just one person doing it is important. When you think about it at an institutional level, if you're taking a DEI role, uh, Dr. Law had mentioned that you need buy-in, and buy-in is very important. When you are learning the structure of your hospital or institution, you need to know who is involved with that work, who can help you, and who has the money, um, because you likely will not have a ton of money, so you need to know who you can partner with and who will support you in your efforts. The other thing is you cannot make change without the buy-in of several key people at your institution. If the CMO is not on board with some of the things you're doing, you will be dead in the water quickly. So if you're creating a new position and you have these goals in mind, meet with those key people before you start the year off, particularly things like we just started a resident uh, a GME committee on diversity and inclusion. In order for this committee to succeed, I'm going to need the CMO. I'm going to need the chief diversity um, officer. I'm going to need the Office of Diversity and Inclusion from the medical school, and I'm definitely going to need the chief experience officer to be on board with all of the things uh, that we come up with as a committee, in addition to, of course, the GME office. But since they charged us with this, I figure they'll be on board. Um, but everybody needs to know where you're going. You don't want to upset anybody. You don't want to cause any issues with the other uh, parties involved because you're going to need their support. Um, and I understand that a lot of the topics that we discuss are very uh, sensitive at times. And so when I say upset people, I just mean if they already have uh, programming in place, there's no need for you to repeat that programming or to contradict said programming. It would be better to be involved with the programming that they have and guided in the right direction uh, than to contradict what is already going on. So how can you fold into what already exists so that you're not reinventing the wheel? And then how can you also add to that um, because you're going for like symbiosis here. We're not going to take over stuff, right? So making sure that you know who who do you need on an institution side and who do you need on a hospital side and how all of that stuff works together is really important. So when I think about best practices in this realm, I think before you get started outlining who it is that's responsible for said metrics and who it is that you report to, that needs to be done up front. That's not something that you want to learn as you go along. I think the other thing is outlining from the very beginning, what are your goals in this role and how are you going to measure that you are actually making progress on that is really important. So that you want your SMART goals, right? Like they need to be measurable, actionable, reasonable, that kind of thing. And if you can't do that, then we need to adjust the goal to something uh, that you can do that with so that you can not only hold yourself accountable, but you also want to make progress. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Bradby. Um, 
And last but not least, Dr. Chu is going to be discussing some of the challenges surrounding DEI positions. Some of them, I think, have been mentioned already, but I think there's um, always more to say on this topic, including but not limited to burnout, compensation, and how do we integrate these roles into the existing infrastructure of departments. Thanks. Um, and so I will admit when I was brought into this panel, I was like, I'm not sure that I should participate because I don't, um, I have a hard time believing in these roles. Um, and I very much believe in the people on this call and I've seen the powerful things they do. Um, but I bring, um, I bring a lot of skepticism to this, having been invited to apply for a lot of these roles and spent a lot of time talking to friends around the country who have been in these roles or were in these roles. And I think um, the issues are, um, many of them are what, uh, what the other panelists mentioned. Um, you're brought in to do a huge and almost impossible job. The expectations are often much higher than the buy down resources support of the rest of the department, as was mentioned. Um, I think also we, um, there's a very small literature on what these offices and roles do, but there was a pretty compelling study published by JAMA internal medicine, I'm sorry, I forget, one of the JAMA journals that um, looked at these offices of diversity um, over time in academic medical centers and actually found that uh, there wasn't a lot of difference in, uh, in recruitment of a diverse faculty between institutions that had these offices and institutions that did not have these offices unless you took a subset of, that, of those um, institutions and pulled out the ones that had uh, extended, sustained, and more intense efforts, and those did actually have success. So it really speaks to um, there's a big difference between sticking up that office or that position um, and really uh, in, um, planning out the, um, you know, your investment and your uh, kind of uh, uh, aggressive investment over, over time and understanding that's going to be a sustained effort. Um, there's just such a huge difference. And I guess my concern in these times, like it is, it's the tokenism. My concern in these times is everyone is throwing up these roles without being thoughtful about it or actually thinking about what is my goal for this in 5, 10, 15 years, because it has to be in for the long haul or you may as not, well not waste your time in oxygen. And, you know, so when I talked to um, a bunch of people about these roles, I mean, I had more than one person was like, that's a great role for you if you wish to burn out in three to five years. And what I want people to know is that these roles take people away from what they originally intended to do. I mean, none of us came into medicine and we're like, I want to be a really great diversity, equity, inclusion role person. You know, we actually came in because we like emergency medicine and we have our own scholarship that has to do with, you know, health equity and, you know, patient-centered things. And then as soon as you come into these roles, it sometimes strips you of your identity because then all people want you in there for is the diversity, equity, inclusion thing. It's like, Nobody, if just off the top of your head, you were like, what should we invite us to Chu for a talk? It's actually not on the thing that I have NIH funding for. In fact, I bet nobody knows what I have NIH funding for. It's like it, it um, kind of moves you away from getting to be actually just a regular doctor. Um, and um, in that way, um, we sometimes derail people's forward mobility in academic medicine because what are you getting promoted for? It's not the DNI work. I mean, I sit on our, our, um, our university's PNT committee, and I will tell you that work um, rarely comes with titles that are meaningful to people. Um, it has no cachet. Um, in the way that research efforts do, um, uh, or even in the way that actually educational roles do, it feels like a fluffy role because of the way that we structure and value those things. So you're basically setting people up to derail their own academic promotion. And I have a lot of concerns about that, um, especially when those roles are not compensated adequately. Um, and I will say all these roles are not just 150%, but you're generally working like 200, 250% for whatever very tiny um, buy down you get. And when I, again, when I talk to people around the country, um, especially departmental roles, um, the buy down is generally zero to 10%. Um, and listen to, when you hear what the scope of what everybody has been talking about, I haven't heard a single person describe something that sounds like a zero to 10% role, but that is what is routine, at least before this time. So um, I don't mean to be like a total naysayer, but I, I really want us, when we talk about these roles and we talk about them like exciting opportunities, um, that seems disingenuous to me. I think we should talk about these roles um, with a full understanding of what we are asking for people. Um, often it is to step away and step out of their regular careers and how do we ever compensate for that? Um, and as part of that, I also wanna say that you rarely ever hear of somebody who is in a DEI leadership role who then becomes 
another role after that. It is not a pathway to something else, like almost any other director or, or vice chair role is. You almost never hear of that person then becoming a clinical vice chair, a chair, a dean, any other meaningful role. That is a terminal role as we currently have it defined. Um, so, um, so how do we offset all these things that I talked about? Um, and again, many of the other panelists talk about it. Um, when we invite people into these roles, um, I really think we should be much more discreet. So don't say, can you come in and be the director of equity, inclusion, and diversity? It's like, okay, of what, all right? Because our, um, our missions are so broad. Is that person gonna be um, in charge of workforce efforts? Um, things like recruitment and hiring and mentorship and promotion and um, salary equity? Um, because actually each of those is a full-time thing to try to correct any of those things. Are they gonna be in charge of scholarship and inclusion um, in the work that your department does? Um, because that is a full-time job. Um, clinical care and the ways in which um, there's health equity, are we gonna you know, directly connect to patient care and make that about health equity? Reviewing things like you know, the very racist GFR calculus you know, trying to trying to dismantle the clinical care that we provide um, and, and make sure there's equity, make sure that our patients walk in and actually feel like they belong there because that is a full-time job. You know, it's like, are they gonna um, review all the educational content across any learner that the department touches um, and, and look for the, the equity and inclusion there? Are they gonna totally review the research content? Because I'll tell you, um, in most departments, we are not taking actually uh, an inclusive and equitable approach to the research that we do. And I'm not saying you need to do Health, health disparities, health equity research, to have a health equity lens in your, in your research. So it's like, what is that person supposed to do? Um, and I actually think these roles should be narrowly defined. I, I, took a, I took a role for the first time. I took a role in my department one week ago. I didn't even have time to tell Tracy when she's doing this um, thing. And I had, a I had a part in defining the role. And I am the, the director of recruitment, equity, inclusion, um, and diversity in our department. And I agreed to take the role on two conditions. One is that it was super narrowly defined because I am not the, the, the queen of all things equity. Um, that is impossible. And then the second thing is um, everyone is responsible and I will support them uh, because these roles cannot be left to one person. Uh, so um, I will just say uh, a couple things solution wise and I will like just kind of burn through them because time is limited, uh, but we can talk about them more. Um, it, th this, this work is not about a person. Um, it's about a department having a comprehensive plan with metrics. Um, there's no one person who can do this for you. Um, and one comprehensive plan, I actually think we should have operational guidelines for inclusion and equity that are in parallel with the operational guidelines we have for an entire department. Um, I think um, there should be an overall vision. It should have very concrete words like racism, like sexism. We're not trying to make everyone nicer or build in more respect or, um, or have less mistreatment. Um, nothing vague, like literally go after racism and sexism um, and, um, and discrimination. Um, and I think, um, I think there should be an entire portfolio that covers all the missions that we're talking about and every single thing, every single goal should be tied to a metric and somebody is responsible for the metric. And most of the responsibility for these metrics is actually not in the hands of the director of whatever, but actually should be um, in the hands of whoever is responsible for that domain. Um, I think in that way, um, the equity conversation should be integrated into the entire department um, in very concrete ways. Um, and then I think um, in terms of the leadership part, I think we need to think about how we structure that creatively. So either there's a high investment or we structure it so that there is a team and they rotate the leadership role so that we can mitigate burnout and give actually people a lot of time to get uh, leadership experience um, and that we can create a lot of subtitles with different amounts of buy down so that um, this becomes a career booster rather than a career killer. And I think that conversation needs to be have had. Um, and then I think in every way, um, the chair or whoever the leader is of that role needs to communicate that this is a role that is highly valued, prioritized, invested in, and is actually a responsibility across the department. Um, and I could go on for a while about these operational guidelines and what they may look like because we're doing it in our department right now. Uh, but I think I'll stop there and just leave room because I see a lot of questions in the chat box. Thanks, Dr. Chu. I, I think that uh, you know you pointed out that essentially that support is one of the key elements, and talking about it from it sounds like even from a, a school's promotional level in terms of making sure that the DEI efforts are recognized and are associated with promotion is another component. But um, one of the things that's popped up in the chat box, and that I think that uh, each one of our panelists has talked about, is is that having that support and what that support looks like. Uh, is one of the key elements. And one of the things that popped up in the chat box was, how did you all develop the support or how do you 
get that support when people at the top are not willing to uh, provide that support up front. So I think that just getting back to what uh, Esther was saying, there's no point in taking these roles if the support's not there uh, because it's ultimately going to be lead to incredible amounts of frustration. You know, if you are taking this role and you're expected to look at it from a, you know, uh, from a quality and equity standpoint, but you're having to pull your own data, you don't have the statistical support to do this work, you don't have the administrative support, you're not, you're trying to pull together all your meetings um, and getting multiple people on board and liaise with other departments, it becomes incredibly frustrating and incredibly difficult to do. And so you have to be cognizant of how you're balancing your time. I think right now people are popping up with these new opportunities. Um, but they're not giving a lot of detail as to what goes in behind it. I think when you enter in negotiations with your department chair about assuming this role, have clear expectations of what you can and can't do, have metrics that are defined for your role, but then also think about how this is gonna be looked at across the entire um, department and who else in those other roles um, that are already established as vice chairs or directors in, um, in different spaces are going to take on some of these responsibilities and whether it's you're supporting them or they're reporting to you as opposed to you trying to fix the problems without getting the support from, uh, from the uh, department itself. Any other thoughts from the other panelists about um, asking for support? I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with the points that Dr. Landry was making. I mean, this is something where if you're approached for one of these positions or you're trying to create one of these positions for yourself, you need to be very concrete about the minimum that you need to have any type of success. So I need a buy down of 0.25 FTE. I need a budget of at least $25,000. I need, you know, administrative support at 0.2 FTE, whatever it might be, but this is a negotiation like any other job. And I think to the points that Dr. Chu was making, you know, these, these sort of right now are positions where you're stuck. You're on a pathway to nothing. So you have to think about how is this going to help you get to the next step? And what in there can your department do in this negotiation to support you? Do you need to go to one of the, one of the AAMC mid-career seminars? Is there another seminar that's being offered in other industry about inclusive workplaces that you need to get to so that you can bring back new ideas? All of these things should be part of your negotiation for this, you know, because certainly there might not be any additional salary, but there certainly can be additional CME or other resource support that you should be asking and advocating for. The other thing you can do is actually, um, you can also negotiate for where you want the entire team to be. Like you can say, I will take this role, but I need the chair to communicate. Actually, the expectation there is 100% compliance with annual implicit bias training, allyship training, anti-racism training. Um, the entire group needs to do that because that basic education is not my role. Uh, so I think you can also build in things to try to protect um, and carve out what your role is along with some parameters for what your role isn't um, because you can get mired in that work which is good and important work but actually um, can be uh, you know can be uh, fulfilled in other ways so that you can actually get to other types of work that are specific to the needs of your department. I think what has been helpful to me is uh, talking to leadership about, we had mentioned earlier about how none of this kind of really helps a lot with promotion and tenure. And so how can you take the things that you're already doing for your DE&I work and turn that into some sort of scholarship to help help you out with promotion and tenure. And so we've been very purposeful in a lot of the stuff that we've done so that we can somehow translate that into an article, into some sort of research, into something that will make it so that everybody involved is not just doing the work. They're also going to get credit for said work when it comes down to getting promoted. Those are all great comments, kind of along those lines. Um, and this is something that I think multiple panelists mentioned. How has the DEI work? So I guess um, to start with, how did each of you get into this area of work? Um, and how has DEI work either complemented or um, been more of a competitor for your other academic interests? 
um, I'd like to hear from, from each of the panelists. So some of the fun part of this has been uh, the opportunity to meet with people uh, that I wouldn't have met otherwise. Like, I don't think that as a residency program director, I would have been in the CMO's office or uh, like I know the chief experience officer and like I've gotten to be in places that I would not have been otherwise uh, in this role. And that has been helpful to me on more than one occasion. Uh, for other reasons, but I think the networking aspect of some of it uh, has been super helpful. Um, and I think that I've been able to advocate for things uh, in a different way than I would have if I wasn't in this role. Um, and so I think that has been particularly helpful. But the other nice part has been being able to meet more students and more residents, not only at my own institution, but other places and kind of have a voice for them and also feel like an advocate an advocate for them and then the other thing was that you know I didn't see these people growing up like these folks didn't exist and uh, I think it is really important to remember that you can't be what you can't see and so being able to be seen so that people can know that well when I grow up I can do that like I saw on Twitter the other day so uh, a student wrote like I'm going to go on to be a residency program director and I'm like what can I do to make that happen and so I think us being in, in such roles and making it so that people see that this is important to the institution enough to have the role, which I know that a lot of times it's tokenism, we can go down that pathway, but I think that uh, it's important to be seen, to be present, um, and that has been quite valuable to me personally. Anyone else? We can also move on to, to additional questions. We have lots to talk about. Okay, let's let's move on to another question, um, just to make sure we're covering lots of ground here. Um, shifting topics a little bit, what are the some of the ways um, that you all can, you all or we can intentionally support residents who are URIM? For example, what would intentional mentorship look like? How can we create safe spaces where these residents feel supported professionally, socially, and emotionally during residency? So, I mean, I think some of this is certainly about intentional mentorship and sponsorship, but some of it has to be organic. Um, you know, certainly as an example, um, at Emory, we have, um, a pretty big group of minority men and women, and we do URIM mixers. Um, one of the attendings, who's also one of the APDs, makes a really big effort to gather the residents outside of work pre-COVID, um, you know, and take people to dinner and have some kind of informal conversations to make sure that they feel supported and that they have a safe space. Um, we have a women's group. We also have an LGBTQ plus group. Um, you know, and we've done like an ally mixer, an ally breakfast and other events, you know, really trying to bring in the entire department to engage, uh, because I think all of us who do this work understand that the critical importance of allyship um, and that we need everybody on board. So I, those are some of the ways in which we at a departmental level support the residents. I know, um, I think Allison in, in the post somewhere in the thread in the chat had said that they have a um, an underrepresented minority resident group for the entire institution. And I think that's a fantastic idea. I know within the medical school, there are some safe spaces for different groups, but I think that gets lost um, as they transcend to GME. Um, but, you know, certainly I think those are all fantastic ideas as well. The one thing I would add is just uh, be careful not to pigeonhole um, UIM students or trainees. It's very easy for us to say, oh, because of this, you should focus your work here or you should think about going to um, do this uh, research project uh, that's very narrowly focused um, because uh, it, that, again, is a barrier to their professional growth and development. And they may have an interest in a subspecialty of emergency medicine or in academics, or they may want to be a, a chair. Um, but if you're telling them this is what you should do because of your race, ethnicity, your sexual orientation, and gender identity, um, then that is automatically um, 
boxing them out for other opportunities that, that they may want to pursue. Along those lines, kind of a follow-up question, how do we select faculty or residents for these positions? So as we have been talking about, we don't want to pigeonhole people. We don't want to um, force a minority tax on people. How do we select people for these positions without doing that? So I'll try and start with this. I'd say the first thing you're going to do is if you build a job description um, and offer the appropriate support with it, you'll have candidates um, who will be willing to apply for this role. Um, it doesn't have to be that junior faculty who just finished residency uh, to be um, loaded down with these types of work. There's plenty of folks across the country who may be interested in this. And if you do put together a good package, you can recruit somebody to come in and fill the space. Um, but if you're, you know, packaging up, um, you know, a, a not so great opportunity with very little support and there's one person there, just don't tag them and say, hey, this is your job and, you know, tell them good luck and expect changes to be made in the next three or five years. I think you That's also make effect. sure that it everybody has the opportunity to throw their hat in the ring. I think it's the, I think oftentimes it's somebody gets tapped to fill the role instead of doing it that way, saying we have this role available, okay, whoever is interested, because I think people are interested that you wouldn't expect to be interested and would not have been the person that whoever is in charge would have tapped. And so I think you get more uh, interested candidates by making sure that you ask everybody like, hey, if you're interested in this, this is we've created this role. Uh, we're looking for somebody to fill this spot as opposed to saying, hey, you faculty member over there, uh, we created this role, we, we would like for you to do this specifically. Uh, and that way it's a little bit more open ended and you're not tapping specific people to do stuff who may not actually be interested in that. I really agree. I mean, when we make these roles opportunities and not burdens, you will know because people will go to them. People go where there is opportunity, where they are challenged, respected, and have opportunity to live up to their highest potential. Um, and so we need to sweeten the pot and sweeten the pot and sweeten the pot until it becomes that role and we don't have to wonder if it's a burden that we're putting on somebody. And then to the point about not tapping people on the shoulder, um, you know, I think part of this is again comes in when you're really thinking through your, your operational guidelines, but we should never be tapping people on the shoulder for roles with buy down of any kind. All roles should be open to everyone. Um, because when we look at our leadership boards across our institutions, which I mean, it's just optics, but still optically we are not doing well. Um, and then talk to people about how those roles were happened. And you'd be amazed. Most people in the department don't really understand leadership succession or how those people got in those roles. They just magically appeared in those roles. Um, or they magically became the only candidate who had exactly the criteria on the job listing. And that did not happen by mistake. That's years of mentorship and sponsorship into those roles. Um, and so if that's happening, um, that is like one of the first things that we should, we should fix. Um, we should really think about how we write these job descriptions, um, who is eligible for that role, who's getting mentorship, and then, and then anything that has, I, I would say, I said buy down, but I would say resources, meaningful resources attached to it and meaningful opportunity attached to it. Um, because of course roles are, as Cassandra said, as Dr. Bradbury said, roles are access to other people and networks um, that you otherwise wouldn't get in. So when we have desirable roles of any kind, um, the tap on the shoulder should be a thing of the past. Great, thank you. There are some more questions from the chat, certainly. Um, we have about four minutes left. Any other burning questions that haven't been put in the chat? Otherwise, I'll kind of keep going down the list. So one question I thought um, was pretty interesting. How do you, as all, you all as formal DEI leaders heal? This work is hard and personal and political and slow. Is there a social support network in emergency medicine for DEI leadership? ADIEM. There's my plug. Thank you. Appreciate cool. that. <laughs> that was for you, Jeff. Well, in AWEM and the Equity and Inclusion Committee, I mean, I think there's a lot of places and spaces um, where many of us do this work together, and we do it across organizations too. I think a lot of us are on ASEPS DIAG, 
A lot of us are involved in CORD's equity and inclusion initiatives. So, you know, a lot of us span the different organizations, but I, I think we're there and I, you know, there's always such a great exchange of ideas and conversation on our regular calls and on the email chains that I think that's how we, how we heal and how we support each other. And I think it's fantastic to see this group growing. You know, now there's a lot of different perspectives from different areas of the country with much, you know, with varying resources at each, each place. So, you know, as Esther said, I think earlier in the, in the chat, this is like a great way for me to highlight some other things that I need to take back to my chair to say, hey, listen, I was on this great webinar and listen to these things I heard that are really exciting. So, you know, I think that idea exchange is how we feel. I think it's also important to get to know the people at your institution. And so I, I meet with a lot of the vice chairs for diversity and inclusion from other departments. And it's been not only helpful in commiserating um, about uh, the slow, slowness of change, but it's also helpful because we can partner together to get things done uh, a little bit differently than it would be if we were individually fighting for stuff. Because um, these are people who also know your institution and also have some pull in different places. and so it works a lot better if you work together uh, than you work individually. And so I think you can also find that support like at home as well as in addition to like our SAM and AWM and ADIM, um, but also don't forget those folks in the other specialties uh, that can also help you drive your mission. Thank you so much. It's, it's 12.59. Um, I think we've had really an excellent hour of thoughts and ideas for best practices. Thank you so much to our four panelists and to my co-moderator, Dr. Gruck. We are planning on um, going through the recording and um, basically writing down and hopefully um, formalizing some of these recommended best practices that we've been discussing, because I think that's another area that we're sorely lacking is a, um, a resource to go for these best practices. So now that we've heard all of these amazing ideas from our panelists, we'll try to, um, to put them into a document. We've had a lot of um, comments about having a SQL call. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get the same panelists, but I think that's a great idea. We need to continue to talk about all of these issues. And so we'll definitely look into that as well. Um, any other um, closing thoughts, Dr. Dreck? No, I think this has been a wonderful call. Um, I, I hope that everybody got material out of this that they can use. And um, I do think that there's, a possibility that if people develop other questions that they want to forward to us, we'd be happy to include them in and uh, get our panelists' opinion on them going forward. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.